patients that come to this facility. Parking fears that the new Waterford will make things worse. The children growing up on the North Coast were quite void of, of role models. He's Inuk, an engineer in training and on a mission. And we will check in with Ryan shortly, of course. But first, our top story, a man charged with serious sexual offenses says he fired his legal aid lawyer today on the advice of private practice lawyer Bob Buckingham. Yeah, Adam Olford told CBC he wants a real lawyer. Here now is Glenn Payette explains. Adam Olford is charged with sexual assault and sexual interference on a girl under 16. His trial was supposed to begin in provincial court in St. John's this morning. But before things got started, Olford fired his legal aid lawyer, Jason Edwards. I fired him today because of the grounds that he only met with me yesterday since the last court date. He never called me to tell me when the court date was. Olford says he wasn't happy with legal aid, so he approached private practice lawyer Bob Buckingham at court today and says that Buckingham told him to get his matter postponed and hire another lawyer. Olford says he didn't like the things he was hearing from Edwards. He said, I'll get a year to five years in jail. He said, I've already convicted, what I'm, like, I'm pleading not guilty, so I fired him today because of these grounds and the grounds that I'm not prepared to go to court today. Edwards told the court he never said Olford was guilty and denied only meeting him once. In court, Edwards turned to Olford and asked him if it was Buckingham who told him to bring up the guilty issue and the meetings. Olford replied, yes. Well, with that, Edwards said the Buckingham matter could be dealt with elsewhere, meaning the Law Society. Buckingham isn't commenting. Meanwhile, Olford is back in court next month to set another trial date. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. As news sinks in that a new mental health facility will be built on the health sciences property, there are new concerns about where patients, visitors and staff will be able to park. Here and now's Ryan Cook reports. This is what an afternoon at the Health Sciences Centre looks like. Cars circling, parking illegally, frustrations made even worse when the toll gates won't lift. It is congested. You come here most any time of the day and everything is full. Except for these spots way at the very back here. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, it's, it's parking is tough. But what's going to happen to all this traffic when 94 new patient beds arrive here from the Waterford? City engineers finished a traffic plan for this area last year, complete with roundabouts on the Prince Philip Parkway. But the Waterford move wasn't even on the table back then. And consider this, if this was a private venture, the owners would need to have a traffic study done way ahead of time. But so far, the city council says the province has not done that. Along the parkway, there's three major hospitals, two huge office buildings, the huge university colleges, and we really need government to step up and help us take care of, of the uh, traffic situation all along the parkway and Elizabeth Avenue for that matter. Now the province has planned for a 120 space parking garage near the new mental health facility, but for Susan Glenn, a stage three ovarian cancer patient, that's just not enough. I think it's gonna be a major problem for patients that come to this facility. Um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful facility, but you know, they, they've had a, pro a problem with their parking for many, many years. Glenn has been fighting for designated cancer patient spaces for three years, but she isn't quitting. Meanwhile, it only took Mike Peters about 20 minutes to get frustrated and park illegally. I'll sit here until they come and tell me I can't park here. <laughs> That's about all I can do. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. Well, just months after Sears closed its doors, more changes are in store for the Avalon Mall, and the city of St. John's is on board. The front of the mall will be extended all the way to the road that runs through the existing front parking lot. The main Kenmount Road entrance will be redesigned into a safer four-way intersection. A new parking garage is being built and plans are underway to remove a strip mall near the former Sears store. The city says it will foot the bill for that intersection because the storm water sewer system is also in need of repair. 
Well, do you have an idea on how St. John's could become a healthier, more active place to live? Well, if so, that could help the city land $10 million in help from the federal government. That's the top prize for the Canadian Smart Cities Challenge designed to get residents moving. The challenge is to combine transportation, planning and urban design in a way that makes it easier to get around the city year round. But with a deadline of April 24th, the city says it doesn't leave much time. The City of St. John sees this as an opportunity to take a meaningful lead on a province-wide issue of public health. So we are the fastest aging, um, most obese, most you know predisposed to diabetes. We are the capital city of the unhealthiest province in Canada and the City of St. John's can take a lead in uh, finding some solutions to our health problems. Well, why do refugees leave this province and how can we keep more of them here? Well, those two questions were examined in a newly released report from Memorial University. Some of the key findings include that many people leave because they can't find work. Language barriers also played a role, as did access to mental and physical health services. The report has some ideas on how to fix the problem, including better access to language training for women. In many cases, they're the primary child care providers. Getting employers to commit to diversity and inclusion training and greater collaboration between organizations that assist immigrants and more money for them to do their work. Marine Atlanta gives warning it may have to cancel some Gulf crossings tomorrow because of expected stormy weather. The company says it is preparing to possibly delay or cancel ferry crossings between Portabasque and North Sydney. The forecast is calling for snow, then turning to ice and then rain. The amount of snow depends on where you live with between 5 and 20 centimeters expected. So a perfect time to welcome Ryan to the show to talk about what's on the way. And hey, my mic's on this time, so that always that always helps. That's, That's okay. Your forecast is so bad, you just turn it off. We don't want to hear. That's right. I actually suspect that you slipped over, turned my mic off on me, so that because uh, Peter was booing me in rehearsal. So yeah. uh, it was a fabulous weekend, though. By we got spoiled. Yeah. I want more of that. Yeah. Today was a nice day too. Yeah. Uh, not so much though tomorrow, and uh, as you mentioned, a little bit of everything here as well. Snow, ice belts, freezing rain and rain. Snow, obviously the main concern, and why don't I, I thought I'd show the uh, snowfall map right off the top here. Uh, even here in the east, northeast, 5, 10 centimeters, not out of the question. Could squeak out a little bit more than that, especially places like the Buren across the south coast, the Burgio Highway, inland areas of that southwest. Uh, higher elevations of western parts of Newfoundland, I think, will be in that 15 centimeter range, Bay Vert Peninsula, then across eastern parts of uh, Labrador. Uh, could see a swath here, a, a narrow band of uh, 15 to 25, even 30 centimeters by Friday morning. Again, this is going to be a Wednesday night story here, a Thursday, Thursday night story across. Labrador and as we take a look at your timeline the good news is that really really quiet through tonight and even tomorrow morning not much of a concern for the drive to work uh, just a few flurries along the west coast but overall it's a smooth drive to work tomorrow as we roll throughout the day though that snow does move in around uh, really starts to ramp up through the lunchtime hour and the early afternoon hours for the southwest some uh, light snow for central parts of Newfoundland a few flakes arriving for metro but I'm not expecting a big impact for that drive home for tomorrow. It'll be more so for tomorrow evening and we'll break down your timeline beyond that coming up in just a few minutes. Peter. Thanks, Ryan. Well, two stranded hikers had to be airlifted from Grossmourne Mountain on Easter Sunday. Search and rescue units reached the hikers overnight. One of them was injured and both were taken to hospital in Cornerbrook. And there was another helicopter rescue. This one last night on the southern shore. A helicopter rescued an injured man who had been reported missing near La Manche. The man was found over an embankment on the edge of a cliff. He was brought to the Health Sciences Centre early this morning. There's no word on his condition. Nalcor has started energizing some of the towers erected for the Muskrat Falls Power Project. Today, the company started turning on power on the transmission lines stretching from Churchill Falls to Muskrat Falls. In total, Nalcor has built 1,600 kilometers of power lines between Labrador and the Avalon Peninsula to carry Muskrat Falls power. Skating season has come to an abrupt end in the Gander area. An ammonia leak discovered last week shut down the town's arena. 
and that's brought heartache for the users. Here now is Garrett Berry has the story. A forgotten skate guard, the only sign of ice left at the Steel Community Center. A small ammonia leak caused a shutdown here Wednesday. It will take weeks to fix. It was minimal. There was nobody in danger at that time. So, but you just don't know where that's going to go if you continue to monitor it. So in the interest, again, of public safety, safety we just, that was it for us. The leak was spotted in the arena's refrigeration unit. Council ordered the arena closed, canceling a figure skating show. We met as an executive group uh, that evening. Um, we met for two to three hours and we tossed out every scenario possible. Um, and ultimately it had to come down to, unfortunately, we had to cancel our ice show this year, which is um, devastating to our skaters. We all felt terribly bad for our skaters. The year-end gala is a chance for skaters to dress up and strut their stuff. The Silver Jets just couldn't find a way to put it off this year. This went out very early in the season of our ice show this April 14th. Um, so people planned around. People took time off work. People took grandparents that want to come see this. So there was a whole bunch of things that we had to take into consideration. Uh, and ultimately they came down to, there was no ice. The groups already spent thousands on costumes. They'll try to use those next year. The town of Gander is also losing money in the form of ice time rentals. Private business will take a hit too because a minor hockey tournament has been forced out of town. It's a huge, a huge event for restaurants, hoteliers, the lo all local businesses, and I'm sure restaurants have ordered excess inventory to um, to supply all these people, which is not happening now. It's, it's. I can't even express to you how we feel as a council that this had to happen. The ice will not be coming back to the Steel Community Center here in Gander this season. Tara Pollitt says town council basically had no choice but to make that decision. She says the only thing they can do now is try to find out a way to make sure this doesn't happen again. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Gander. An Inuk man is hoping his career will inspire Indigenous children. Brian Pottle works on, at Solus Power in Mount Pearl. He helps design cutting-edge technology. As Here Now's Ramona Deering tells us, he's motivated by both the heartache ache, and success he's experienced. Hey, uh, Chris. Brian Pottle is both Inuk and an electrical engineer in training, working for a tech company that's all about wireless power. Solus Power, our customer here, developed a system where they can actually charge these drones uh, actually uh, several inches above a charging pad. That kind of innovation happens right here in this workspace in Mount Pearl. Would uh, the voltage potentially be too high for the, uh, for the diodes? Uh, the voltage should be pretty good. In some ways, it's a different world than Postville and Rigolette on the north coast of Labrador, where Pottle spent time as a kid. In other ways, the creativity is familiar to him. You need to be resourceful to make things that are old uh, and are breaking down, snowmobiles, what have you. You have to figure out ways to, to procure parts or, or fashion or modify parts to, uh, to get these old things into the future. By contrast, this office is state of the art. For instance, this room blocks out electromagnetic waves to make testing more accurate. Here, Pottle measures current and voltage and checks the temperature to see if things are getting hot. He's proud of what he does. I feel a sense of responsibility to help enable other Inuk children or Indigenous children in general in particular to, uh, to just apply themselves and, and actually get out and experience the world and see what's out there. He keeps this little creation at his house Pottle takes it with him to inspire children whenever he's back home in Labrador. And has little eyes here in the front that can tell you when something's in front of it. And then it will just avoid colliding with things by uh, moving away when, when it sees something. It gets a big reaction, as does the drone. He's taking university courses on the side. He reads physics books for his own pleasure. All very impressive but he paid the price growing up. Pottle says his love of learning is one reason why other children bullied him. I developed a, a thick skin out of necessity, which helps me now to, 
to be an, ex uh, an excellent engineer who is able to persevere in the face of a very tough challenge or, or tight deadline. And he's had those challenges, the worst kind. In this portrait, he's on the left, his brother, Dylan Pottle, on the right. Yeah, I just, I just, I will never be able to forget when I found out. Almost four years ago, Dylan took his own life. He was only 21. That's Brian on the left again and Dylan on the right. Brian needed more than memories. He needed to take action. I uh, am actually an engineer, uh, believe it or not, as my profession. <laughs> he started accepting invitations to speak at Indigenous summits about suicide prevention. I remember it quite vividly. It was 10.47 in the morning. I was parking and I got a call from my dad and he asked me to sit down. This is last year's National Inuit Youth Summit in Nain, Labrador. Suicide need never be an option, that there are always better ways to go about uh, to go about life, to find ways out of these darkest, uh, these darkest times. I did feel I, I owed it to the memory of my brother to, to get through my own fear of public speaking. Love is a burning thing. He's only 26. With all his responsibilities, he doesn't get much time to kick back and relax. Do you have to work this weekend? No, I shouldn't need to. His wife, Megan Pottle, shares the chores on the home front. Ask him what he'd like to say to young people who are Indigenous. And this is what he says. What I've learned is that being yourself, is, is being true to yourself, who you are, is, is how you're going to live a happy, successful life. Embrace your individuality, says Pottle. You never know where it might take you. Ramona Deering, CBC News, St. John's. A rare, quiet moment at the Worlds in Las Vegas. Devin Haru breaks down why Brad Guju is struggling to focus.
and let us see. Peter, what are we doing right now? <laughs> we want to apologize, <laughs> having a little, little technical difficulty here. T took us by surprise, but here we go. Brad Guju's Team Canada was back on the ice in Las Vegas today where the Men's World Curling Championship is being held. It took an extra end against Korea, but Guju was able to rack up another victory and now sits 4-1. and one. The team is tied with Scotland and Norway for second place. But despite the scoreboard, Guju seems to be having a bit of a tough time staying focused so far. And to explain why, uh, we're joined by Devin Haru, who is covering the curling competition for CBC Sports. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, it's great to see you, Devin. Now, we want to talk about Brad. He seems to be off his game. What seems to be the problem? I think everybody is distracted here in Las Vegas, Debbie, and that is the thing. I had a long conversation with Brad and the boys yesterday after their win, and they said, you know what? This is so bizarre. This is so different. It's unlike any bond spiel we've ever taken part in. Coming into the Orleans Arena here in Las Vegas, you have to go through a pool party, which is a patch here. <laughs> it's just unlike anything curling has ever experienced here for a world championship. And they said, Brad specifically said, it just doesn't feel right. We're so used to being in a bubble. Of course, in St. John's, when they won the Briar, there was all that hoopla, but they really stayed away from all of it. Here, they haven't been able to escape it because the hotel is connected to the curling arena here. They're staying at the host hotel. Their family's here. They're at the buffet with the fans before the game. Like I said, it's bizarre. They haven't really had their heads in curling. I don't blame them. Today, they looked a little more focused. They had an important meeting last night to talk about all of these Viva Las Vegas distractions. <laughs> so, Debbie, they, look, they looked more prepared today, but certainly it's playing a factor here in the desert heat. Now, we have seen some pictures of the lineups there uh, for uh, Team Guju autographs. We saw Elvis at the opening ceremonies. I'm just wondering how popular, though, is curling in Vegas? Well, I certainly think it's a lot more popular because of John Schuster and his Olympic gold medal win in Pyeongchang uh, in February. So the game of curling, Debbie, at this point is, is taking off in the United States. They're hoping to sort of capture magic in a bottle here. And it's all anyone wants to talk about from the American side here. But when I look around all of these stands, every time I come to the curling rink, Canadians are everywhere. The crowd has been a little disappointing to this part, but uh, there's a big game brewing, United States versus Canada Thursday night. They're pumping it up here. I expect the place to be rocking. It's a bit of a curling renaissance in the United States right now. But again, I'll go back to the fact, Debbie, that it's just really bizarre to be in this chilly rink. I have a sweater on right now, and then I have a T-shirt underneath and shorts to go out by the pool right <laughs> after the games. You know, I'm envious, but anyway, I digress. Let's go back to <laughs> talking about Guju's performance. They did win uh, a short while ago. He hasn't been playing with his best numbers, especially for his hits. Um, he admits he's had trouble reading the ice, but do you think he's uh, improving now? Uh, certainly this morning they were a lot better. The team, all of them, Mark Nichols and I had a long conversation uh, last night as well talking about the ice conditions here. I go back to the weather. It's 30 degrees Celsius outside. It's chilly in here. The ice crew is on the ice behind me right now working tirelessly in between draws, Debbie, because they have a monumental task. It is hot outside. They're trying to control the environment here. And so far, it's been a challenge. And Brad Gushu and his rank out of St. John's, they're a team that loves really good ice because they're so precise. And I think it's important to note that when there are sort of tricky ice conditions, it certainly favors the, the less talented team on the ice because there's so many invariables. So that's one of the things we'll track throughout. They seem to have a much better grasp on it here this morning. Like I said, the ice crew working very hard. Some Canadians on the ice here as well helping out, of course. But uh, we'll continue to watch that as this goes along. Now, uh, Team Guju is up against Japan tonight. What kind of competition will he face from that team? 
I don't expect it to be a very close game. Of course, uh, this Gushu team, I think, is in a league of their own. Everybody is sort of talking about the rest of the world catching up with Canada and pointing back to the Olympics and the fact that the two teams there didn't even make it onto the podium. But here tonight against Japan, I don't expect this Canadian team to have much trouble. Although, Debbie, I'll admit, I've been saying that through some of these games here, you pointed to the Korea, uh, the Korea extra end win just a moment ago. I didn't expect it to get to extra ends. So who knows what's going to happen? We'll all be watching, of course. But I expect this one to be over in a hurry. At least I hope so, because like I said, there's a pool party waiting outside. <laughs> Devin Haru, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we'll dip into the competition hopefully again before the end of the tournament. Thank you, Devin. You bet, Debbie. Thank you. Well, no one has anything to fear from me, says sleep watcher Barry Sinclair. We'll tell you why. Time to, now to bring in Ryan, who's got a pretty miserable forecast for pretty much oh, all you. of Labrador. <laughs> yeah, you. no, well, thank nice you. Nice delivery, for, though. <laughs> but what I was wondering about is we didn't really get Sheila's brush at all. That's supposed to be the first 
big storm after St. Patrick's Day. So is this too late now to really count? I think count? it's too late, yeah. I think Sheila's ship has sailed, <laughs> um, so to speak, because, yeah, we're into early April now, and yeah, we, we really see snow through April into May. I think the Sheila storm uh, just didn't really happen for eastern Newfoundland this year anyway. Uh, but uh, that said, this will be a storm for some of us, uh, especially the Wreck House area. Again, it's going to be very gusty there. Labrador certainly getting into, I think, warning criteria for snowfall, especially in central and western areas by the time we get to Thursday. We may see the warnings expanded there. At the moment, special weather statements are in effect for Newfoundland and Labrador. Wreck House is under that wind warning with some gusts of 120. And here is again, in case you missed it off the top, uh, snowfall totals by Friday morning. Here's where we do have that potential through Thursday to Thursday night of getting more than 15 centimeters. A widespread 5 to 10 centimeters across the island. Certainly the potential to see 10 to as much as 15 in some spots. The best chance of that looks to be over the Buren, the southwest coast areas up the west coast in the house, higher elevation areas and into southeastern parts of Labrador as well. The system itself, you can see it's quite quiet right now, is brewing off to our south and west. And there it is moving up through the Great Lakes, some snow, ice, and even some rain and thunderstorms there. And as we take a look at your morning outlook, it's going to be quite quiet. Just some flurry chances along the west, and I'll direct your attention to western Labrador, where if the temperature dips below minus 28 tomorrow morning, that will be a new record for Lab West for tomorrow's date. So it is going to be a very, very chilly morning there. Minus 32 in early April is cold, uh, even in western parts of Labrador. Now, again, tomorrow morning, flurries along the west coast. Those will uh, uh, become a little more uh, prevalent into the afternoon, a better chance of seeing those uh, flurries, and then light snow takes over from southwest to northeast through tomorrow afternoon. Again, arriving around the drive home time for St. John's. I think the snow will be pretty light if it is coming down. I'm not expecting any big travel concerns. Maybe a little bit on the greasy side, but uh, not too, too, too bad out there for the drive home. Some sunshine to start the day in the east and northeast tomorrow before those clouds thicken up through the morning. And again, that snow really starting to ramp up for the south and west. Tomorrow in Labrador is pretty quiet, though do watch for building cloud cover through the day. Really, it's just a chance of seeing some flurries for the Straits by the end of the day and up towards the Northern Peninsula, but it's more so a Wednesday evening story. Watch your timeline here. Here we are at 11 p.m. It's the snow still on the go for St. John, so really it's that uh, supper time hour through to around midnight where we have our best chance of seeing that 5 to 10 centimeters and then that transition to ice pellets, freezing rain through the overnight hours right from St. John's to Corner Brook. And then that change over to rain through the overnight hours. And by Thursday morning, we're looking at rain and drizzle for most of us. Uh, perhaps just some lingering freezing rain along the north coast. And there's that snow continuing right through the day on Thursday in Labrador. While Newfoundland, it's some gusty southerly winds, rain, drizzle, some fog patches, and temperatures rising into the high single, even low double digits by the time we get to Thursday. So you can see where that rain will march from west to east across the island on Thursday. We'll actually see a bit of sunshine breaking through over western areas of the island and that uh, bit of a mix in the southeast parts of Labrador with snow on the go for Happy Valley Goose Bay in the southwest. Uh, quick heads up for Friday in case you are doing some traveling. Looks like a breezy day with onshore flurries for the west coast. Temperatures certainly really dropping in behind the system back to and below freezing. The snow uh, will start to taper off for you folks in Labrador slowly but surely through the day. Long range details right through the weekend coming up. A man once accused in a notorious Halifax voyeurism case was at court in St. John's today. Barry Sinclair has not been charged with any crimes in Newfoundland, but police believe he will commit an offense and hurt a woman here. They want him placed on a strict set of conditions. Today, Sinclair told the court he is a changed man. Here now is Rob Antle has the details. Barry Sinclair has been here at Provincial Court in St. John several times over the past year to hear others talk about his long criminal history and talk about how they believe he's a risk to women. Today, Sinclair had the chance to go on the stand himself and tell his side of the story. Sinclair's criminal record dates back to 1980. He served five federal prison terms, the most recent one in 2012, a five-year sentence for a break and enter into a woman's home in Halifax. The same year, he was found not guilty of voyeurism, related to the so-called Sleepwatcher case in Nova Scotia. Today in St. John, Sinclair had a message for the court. His criminal past is just that, the past. 
I haven't broken the law since I got out of prison, because I made that promise. A promise to family back in Newfoundland, where he moved when his most recent sentence ended. Sinclair says he has a support network here, helping keep him out of trouble. Even though he says he's under pressure, facing an interim set of conditions while his case is before the courts. Constant police attention, and 2 a.m. visits from officers making sure he's not breaching his curfew. I don't want to go to prison. Those days are over. Nobody has to fear anything from me or that I'm going to harm them in any way. It's not going to happen. The case will be back in court at the end of the month for lawyers to continue with their final submissions. Then it will be up to the judge to make his decision. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. I wonder to this day what happened to him and where he is. Aaron Dragonetti woke his housemate at 4 a.m. one Sunday morning in August of 2014, saying he had to go to British Columbia because of an emergency. We have yet to establish uh, what that emergency was. He wasn't in St. John's long. He arrived just as quietly as he vanished. This is the story of Aaron Dragonetti, a man whose name you've likely never heard, but he's one of dozens on the RNC's missing persons list. Here now is Arianna Kelland brings us this episode of Last Scene. <laughs> Aaron Dragonetti was staying at a home on Southside Road. A long street spread along St. John's Harbor, nestled under tree-dotted hills. According to the woman who lived there, Aaron was excited for turkey dinner that Sunday. So it was a surprise when he woke her up at 4 o'clock Sunday morning. Aaron Dragonetti said he had to go. There was an emergency back home in British Columbia. From the best of our knowledge, that's the last that anybody has heard or seen of Aaron Dragonetti. Still wonder to this day what happened to him and where he is, and hopefully he's all right wherever he is. Aaron 
Meganetti was 31. Traveled internationally. A twin, a brother to three men. In 2012, he was working in the oil patch in Alberta. That's where he met friend Colin Graham. He was very easy going, very, uh, very laid back guy. Uh, you know, he was hard worker and uh, never saw him in a bad mood. By the summer of 2014, Aaron Dragonetti had come to St. John's. Why he was here is a mystery, but police know why he stayed. He'd met a woman, but it was short lived. The relationship ended by July, and weeks later, Aaron Dragonetti would seemingly vanish. By November of 2014, his mother would get so worried she'd call the RNC and report her son missing. If there was an emergency in BC, it was a surprise to those who knew him. We spoke with family members, we spoke with friends and associates that Aaron had in St. John's. Uh, we spoke with friends and associates that, we, that he had in British Columbia. And we have yet to establish uh, what that emergency was. While Aaron Dragonetti didn't have a criminal record in St. John's, Warren says he was friends with those who did. One of those people was Gordy Bishop, a man who was banished from Newfoundland in 2016. He seriously injured a police officer by dragging her with his car. Bishop posted on Aaron Dragonetti's Facebook page during the summer he went missing. Dragonetti had been dating Gordy Bishop's sister April, and he was staying at the Bishop house the morning he reportedly left for BC. Bishop's mother was asked by CBC about the case and said Dragonetti just up and left one morning. April Bishop did not respond to CBC on Facebook. Back in BC, Colin Graham got a call from police. Maybe he had spoken to Aaron Dragonetti. I was totally blindsided by it. I thought maybe he was just being quiet or maybe he was out in camp or, you know, just didn't have a whole lot, you know, to do with Facebook at that time. But uh, until I'd received the phone call, uh, yeah, I was, I was surprised by it. And another peculiar point. Aaron Dragonetti flew into St. John's, but there's no record he ever flew out. But of course, there are other ways to leave a place unnoticed a theory, a fake passport. At the time he went missing, we believe he had uh, two cell phones that he was utilizing. Neither of those cell phones were actually subscribed to Aaron Dragonetti. We also received information during the course of our investigation that he would change cell phones on a pretty regular basis. Those cell phones led nowhere, a dead end. On the West Coast, Dan Dragonetti has no idea what happened to his younger brother, but fears the worst. He says he's received little information from police, some of it contradictory. A far-flung theory is that Aaron left the country for Vietnam, but we have no evidence of this. He simply has a friend there, and he's been there before. If someone knows where Aaron Dragonetti is, they're not talking. If he's gone underground, he's done a good job of it. We have no evidence to support or suggest that uh, he met with any foul play while here in St. John's. Uh, but of course, on the contrary, we have no factual evidence to suggest that he left the province. Maybe the guy is just off the radar and, you know, maybe he had enough of social media or his job or, you know, had some kind of issues and just decided to travel and, uh, you know, who knows, maybe the guy's backpacking somewhere in some country, you know. If he's out there, hopefully he's doing okay and, uh, you know, maybe we'll hear from him one day. Well, you're looking at what scientists say is the most distant individual star known to humans. They've nicknamed it Icarus. It's possibly thousands of times brighter than our sun, and it's estimated the light from it has traveled for more than nine billion years before reaching us. Wow. A little look back in time. <laughs>
now to introduce you to our young athlete of the day, and this is hockey player Tony Goodyear Jr. from Fortune. Tony's 12 years old and laces up with the United Town Pirates. We hope you had a great season on the ice, Tony. Congratulations on being chosen as today's Young Athlete of the Day. So I guess we have a better look at the long-range forecast, but mm -hmm. it's probably going to recap the messy weather that's coming, hey? Yeah, a little bit of everything here. Uh, but, uh, you know, the long story short, there's basically three systems to watch over the next seven days or so. Mm. Uh, so an active pattern, and typically when an active pattern happens in April, it's a messy pattern with mm -hmm. snow and ice and rain. And Have a look at the temperature contrast right now across eastern North America, and it kind of sets the stage. Minus 8 in Kenora and Thunder Bay, minus 16 in Labrador City, but look at the warm air pushing up into southern Ontario right now. Montreal at 7, Charlottetown at 4, Halifax is at 5, and we are going to be tapping into some of that warmer air on the other side of this system, but not until Thursday. We have to get through the cold air that's in place ahead of it that will be, again, helping to bring the snow, the ice, and then uh, finally some freezing rain, and then over to rain uh, as we finally tap into that warm sector. So watch as this thing plays out. It will be tracking in with a lot of snow for places like the Gas Bay in New Brunswick, upwards of 30 centimeters there. And we could be talking about as much as 15 to 30 for places in Labrador as well. On the island, the snow is not going to last as long and so we won't get into those heavier totals. Uh, we are talking though a widespread 5 to 10 centimeters and maybe even squeaking out some 15 centimeter amounts. Wednesday evening this is when we'll start to see that transition from snow to ice pellets and freezing rain first along the south coast scooping up across the island through Wednesday night and by Thursday morning we have changed terrain for most of us. There's the mixing for the northern peninsula through Thursday morning and that snow continues and will be at its steadiest in Labrador through the day on Thursday while the island gets into some of that warmer air we're talking about that is building off to the south. Double digit potential for the island and then back to the colder air that wraps in on the other side of the system on Friday and we're talking about onshore flurries for the west coast. So in terms of the snowfall forecast, in case you missed it, again, a widespread 5 to 10, best chance of 15 with these areas, uh, 10 to 15 with these areas in blue. And I think the bullseye here will be up through central west Labrador, depending on the exact track, and we'll keep you posted on that. A look into the long range. Another system brewing out of the Great Lakes will be tracking in as we roll into the Friday night, Saturday time period, Saturday morning time period. It looks like it will bring a mix of snow, ice, and rain to once again eastern portions of the island. Perhaps snow, I don't think it'll be quite as uh, as uh, heavy as this uh, latest system that's tracking in, but certainly the potential for more accumulating snow for central and west. A bit of a change back to snow on Sunday morning possible for the east, and then another system brewing for later Sunday in through Monday. So a lot to track over the next seven days. Now that system Sunday into Monday is still a little uncertain at this point, uh, given we're uh, five, six days out, but here's how uh, the next few play out. And again, pretty good certainty here that high single, low double digits for Thursday. We're really falling back for uh, Friday. Another messy mix for Saturday, where I think we're uh, snow to rain for Eastern Newfoundland, especially, uh, maybe not so for Central and West. And then Sunday, a bit quiet before that next system arrives for Sunday night. Now, Labrador, good chance of accumulating snow Thursday through Friday. Saturday into Sunday, a little quieter. And in fact, into next week, may get clipped in the southeast, but overall, a quieter stretch of the weekend into early next week in the Big Land. That's your forecast to now. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. In national and international news tonight, we have a new president at the CBC in Radio Canada. Catherine Tate has worked in film and TV for more than 30 years, including Telefilm Canada and the company that produced This Hour Has 22 Minutes. Today, she was also described as an early adopter of digital production during this time of major change in the media industry. We must focus on the services, news, and programming that most connect with our public, not just as one audience, but as many audiences. This is, after all, the power of digital. Tate said it was an honor to be chosen as the first woman to lead CBC Radio Canada and called the position her dream job. 
Canada's correctional system is dealing with the blunt end of the opioid crisis. The rate of overdose behind bars is surging in many parts of the country, yet treatment is hard to get in provincial facilities. And that has deadly consequences for lives both in and outside. Our health reporter Vicka Dopia has more on that story. Withdrawn. Breach. It's a prolific rap sheet. Amber McPherson pieces together the paper trail left by her brother, Curtis McGowan. Pages of petty crimes and hospital admission records. The cycle of probation, overdose and rearrest ended here in the Toronto area last fall when he got his hands on fentanyl, smuggled in. He OD'd in, of all places, a cell in the infirmary. Why was my brother dead in the medical unit? And they check them every 20 minutes with a log thing. They go by. So I want to know, how did this happen? Like, I think we deserve to know that. Like, I find it amazing that he survived an overdose on the streets but dies of one in jail. McGowan's family says he was desperate for treatment but didn't get it. So you've been taking quantity lately at all? Not a surprise for this former jail doctor. She says physicians are reluctant to offer addictions treatment in provincial facilities where stays can be just weeks or months and the population transitory. She surveyed medical facilities in Ontario jails. About half of the doctors who responded acknowledged they don't even offer drug treatment. Some of them don't see that as their job. They see the, their role as being primary care providers. This is sort of like a walk-in clinic site setting. I'm going to deal with the urgent issue. I'm not here to prevent anything that happens in the future necessarily. British Columbia is one of the provinces trying to change that. Last fall, it took responsibility for inmate health out of the hands of corrections officials and gave it to the Ministry of Health to ensure access to treatment is the same behind bars as it is outside. There hasn't been one fatal overdose since. Ontario is considering the same move. Too late for eight inmates who died in one Ontario facility alone and who are now the subject of an inquest starting next week. A separate investigation is also underway into Curtis McGowan's death. For now, the answers his sister has are in his last letter to her, penned in jail. What I'm trying to say is I need help, and I don't like asking for help. Treatment that never came. Vicodopia, CBC News, Guelph, Ontario. Prince Philip is in a London hospital tonight, and he's supposed to undergo surgery tomorrow. The 96-year-old is having a hip operation. It was already planned. Officials are not giving details and say more updates will be issued when appropriate. The Queen's husband announced last May he was retiring from most public duties. In November, the royal couple celebrated 70 years of marriage. Our viewer picture of the day, a nice sunset in eastern Newfoundland. And uh, if you know your geography and you know your uh, beautiful pictures that have come <laughs> from this province, then you may be able to get a clue with that rock formation that's out in the water on the right-hand side of the picture. Uh, I haven't got anything, Ryan, <laughs> except that that is a Nutty. beautiful picture. We'll have all the answers after the break.
Well, nothing good can happen when you leave pepperoni near an open window in the plain sight of seagulls. Have a look. One Nova Scotia man found himself banned for 17 years from a BC hotel. Nick Birchall had a suitcase filled with pepperoni for his friends during a visit to Victoria. Yeah, he'd left his hotel room with the suitcase open on a chilly April day, returning later to find more than 30 seagulls flying around, feasting on the Halifax delicacy. And probably left behind some debris mm. of sorts. <laughs> yes. But uh, now, after all these years, he managed to get the Fairmont uh, Empress Hotel to get the ban lifted. <laughs> I wonder if whoever had to clean up that room forgives oh. him no. Oh, yeah, the, uh, the cleanup bill could not have been cheap on that. Uh, okay, so before the break, showed you a beautiful picture. There Gorgeous. There was a clue there. You see those uh, rock formations uh, just on the right-hand side of the screen. This is White Way, and uh, folks have uh, submitted pictures of this very uh, scene before and uh, called that rock formation Shag Rock or uh, the Three Sisters there uh, in uh, beautiful White Way, Trinity Bay. We were in beautiful. commercial and I looked it up on Google. It is gorgeous as the daylight shot online here. Absolutely. Very nice. And thanks to Lorraine George and everybody who have been uh, posting pictures on my Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash Ryan Dots Not. And I literally, uh, I try, I do like them all, but, and I do click like on them all, but it's hard to, of course, share them all because there are so many. So. Yeah, and before we go, a lot of people are keeping an eye on Brad Guju and his right. rink, which are, they're actually playing a game right now in Las Vegas. Latest score, they're up 5-1 over Japan. And Devin Haru, who we spoke with earlier, said he expected that Team Guju would uh, do well against them. So yeah, so a good far, early so start good. for them <laughs> at the end of the third end. So there good you go. Good night, everyone. See you back here tomorrow. Good, good night. night.